Welcome everybody uh, on this beautiful afternoon. I'm just so impressed with people who have shown up here at an inside event on such a beautiful day. This is commitment. Thank you all for joining us. And also a very warm welcome to, for those of us joining us virtually. I understand there's many of you. It has been an amazing week, uh, right up until the very end. Our final event of Alumni Reunion 2022 is today's lecture featuring Dr. Cynthia Cameron. Dr. Cameron joined the Faculty of Theology at St. Mike's in, Ju in July 2021 as the Patrick and Barbara Keenan Chair in Religious Education. I'll just take a side note here and say this is the first event I'm not introducing myself at, and I think that's because you're all tired of hearing that. The Keenan Chair was established in 2002 thanks to the generosity of Patrick and Barbara Keenan launching a major graduate teaching initiative in religious education in Canada, Canada's largest English-speaking Catholic university. Dr. Cameron has a special interest in the development of Catholic adolescents and the impact of ministry in schools. Her research focuses primarily on the intersection of Catholic theological anthropo anthropo anthropology, I just made up a word that I have no right to make up, anthropology and questions of age and particularly in regard to adolescence. Her work responds to the question of how age affects the ways we think about what it means to be human. Dr. Cameron teaches courses within the Masters of Religious Education program, including Catholic educational documents, faith development across the lifespan, and the educator in theology, as well as courses for the Master of Theological Studies and Master of Divinity programs. She also teaches and supervises graduate students through the Graduate Center in the Toronto School of Theology. Today, Dr. Cameron will explore Pope Francis's hopes for what our theologies of the human person would look like if we take youth seriously. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cynthia Cameron. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful invitation to join you all today, and I appreciate everybody giving up a little bit of their Sunday afternoons. Um, okay. Christus Bivet, released in 2019, is Pope Francis's fourth apostolic exhortation and is the culminating document of the 2018 meeting of the Synod of Bishops, which focused on youth and young adults. In this document, Francis lays out his visions for a church that is renewing its attention to its formation of and ministry to young people. In a time when, at least in Europe and North America, many young people are disaffiliating from the church. The Pope is calling for the church to seek renewed relevance in the lives of its young people. He wants to make the case that the church and Christian faith have much to offer to young people. Addressed to both young people and to the church as a whole, Francis calls both audiences to see each other with fresh eyes and with loving concern. In this apostolic exhortation, Francis provides us with a helpful reflection on young people in the 21st century. He includes a fairly wide age range in his considerations, approximately 16 to 29 years of age. As we take up his reflections today and put them into conversation with other theologians, I'm gonna be focusing more on mid-adolescence, kind of in the 16 to 18 or 19 range. So the purpose of this essay is to explore some of Francis's hopes for young people and to see where his reflections might lead us in the construction of a theological anthropology that takes adolescence seriously. After briefly describing the need for a theological anthropology of adolescence and exploring one path laid out by Karl Rahner, this essay sketches these hopes that Pope Francis articulates in Christus Vivit. And it concludes by suggesting some potential areas where theologians can explore further. Age discrimination or ageism is often listed along other, alongside other forms of marginalization, such as those based on gender, race, class, or sexual orientation. 
However, it is not well explored in systematic theology. This lacuna means that we do not have significant theological reflection on what it means for humans as created by God to age. In other words, while there is a great deal of theological reflection on what it means for humans as created by God to have different genders or races, there is not sufficient reflection on the category of age. Including age in our theological vision of what it means to be a human person is all the more important since age is never a stable category in a person's life. The experiences of a single human being vary as she ages. Being an infant, a toddler, a child, a teenager, a young adult, a middle-aged adult, and an elderly person are all quite different. And while there is continuity of identity as that single person ages, there is also sig significant variety in the experiences of a single human being living a natural lifespan. A variety not often considered by theologians seeking to describe what it means to be a human being. When theologians do reflect on age as a relevant category for theological anthropological exploration, the tendency is to focus on children particularly on their faith and moral development. One of, however, one of the first Catholic theologians to consider children theologically is the Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner. Despite its age, his 1963 essay, Ideas for a Theology of Childhood, is one of the few theological considerations of what it means to be a child. As Rahner himself noted, quote, Scripture and tradition alike presuppose that we already know precisely what a child really is, far more than they tell us explicitly or treat it as a distinct question, end quote. Despite the fact that he is focusing on children rather than adolescents, Rahner's theological reflections are nevertheless helpful in providing examples of how theologians can effectively reflect on age as a theological category and on the theological meaning of adolescence. In particular, Rahner's essay raises a key, a key insight to keep in mind as we think about adolescence in our theological anthropologies. For Rahner, everything about being a human person created by God that pertains to the adult also applies to the child. Rather than understanding childhood as merely a stage through which we must pass in order to reach the goal of adulthood, Rahner sees childhood as an essential element in the totality of human existence. He argues that childhood, quote, is important in itself also as a stage of man's personal history in which that takes place, which can only take place in childhood itself a field which bears fair flowers and ripe fruits, such as can only grow in this field and in no other, and which will themselves be carried into the storehouses of eternity." End quote. However, even though there are aspects of human development that can only happen in childhood, Rahner is careful to say that childhood is graced in itself and not just as a precursor to adulthood. He is worth quoting at some length here. Quote, the special character of childhood may always be fading away so far as we are concerned and may also disappear into that which comes afterwards in, in a point of time so that it seems only to derive its justification and its value from this, but this is not so. This morning does not derive its life simply from the afternoon which follows. This playtime with its beauty is not important simply as a prelude to life as lived in, a, in full earnest. It is unique. It has a value in itself, admittedly precisely as that which contributes unreservedly to that which is to come. It is precious not merely because it seeks the riches of life in its maturity. The strange and wonderful flowers of childhood are already fruits in themselves and do not merely rely for their justification on the fruit that is to come afterwards. The grace of childhood is not merely the pledge of the grace of adulthood. 
the fact that it contributes to the latter, to the later stages of life, is not the sole criterion of its own intrinsic rightness. It must be the case that childhood is valuable in itself, that it is to be discovered anew in the ineffable future which is coming to meet us." End quote. As we seek to construct a theological anthropology that considers adolescence, we need to attend to Rahner's concern that childhood is a life stage that is valuable in its own right. Similarly, adolescence is valuable because there are developmental tasks that can only take place during this life stage. At the same time, it is a time that is graced by God with its own intrinsic rightness and not merely as a way station on the road to adulthood. Protestant theologian David Jensen adds a complication to our thinking. He notes that there is a significant challenge of writing theology for and about a group of people to which one no longer belongs. However, he does name a way forward. Because we are in relationship with children, we can speak authentically for children who are not yet capable of speaking theologically for themselves, he claims. The challenge then for including a consideration of adolescence in our theological anthropology is whether having passed through this life stage ourselves, and being currently in a variety of formal ministerial relationships and informal friendships with adolescents gives us a sufficient glimpse at their experiences of their own humanity. Perhaps this, combined with dialogue with young people themselves, can provide theologians with a sure enough footing for constructing a theological anthropology of adolescence that is adequate and affirming of these young people. Given the gap that I have described in our theological anthropological reflections on adolescence, we can turn our attention to Francis's understandings and hopes for them. It is worth the reminder that as an apostolic exhortation, Francis did not intend this document to be a formal exploration of a theological anthropology of young people, nor is he offering explicit direction for how these young people should be included in and considered by a systematic theology of the human person. Nevertheless, because this is an official document of the church, it is available to theologians as we engage in sustained thinking about this gap in our theological anthropologies and how a consideration of adolescence can enrich our theological reflections on the human person. That said, Christus Vivit does give us clear indications of what Francis thinks about young people. From this, some aspects of Francis's operative theological anthropology can be described. There are three key insights that are revealed in this document. First, Francis's theological anthropology is grounded in his Christology, particularly his focus on friendship with Jesus. Second, this anthropology is oriented towards human flourishing, both for young people and for old, all people. And third, and most importantly, that youth is a legitimate life stage, worthy and important in its own right. So first, Francis's operative theological anthropology of young people is profoundly rooted in his Christology, particularly his understanding of the importance of friendship with Jesus. God's overflowing love for humanity is embodied in Jesus. Francis puts it this way, quote, the very first truth I would tell each of you is this, Jesus loves you. It makes no difference whether you have already heard it or not. I want to remind you of it. God loves you. Never doubt this. Whatever may happen to you in life, every moment you are infinitely loved, end quote. Jesus's death and resurrection mean that his friendship and indeed friendship with God is always offered along with life, joy, and hope. He says, quote, alive, Jesus can be present in your life at every moment to fill it with light and to take away all sorrow and solitude. Because he did not come in the past, because he did not only come in the past, 
but he comes to you today and every day, inviting you to set out towards ever new horizons, end quote. Francis sees an intimate connection between the youthfulness of Jesus and the youthfulness of adolescence. The fact that Jesus died while still what we might call a young adult provides a foundation for relationship between Jesus and each young person that can develop into a profound friendship. After arguing in the second chapter of his exhortation that Jesus is both young and youthful, Jesus invites young people to seek out a friendship with this youthful Jesus, arguing that this friendship can provide meaning and grounding to life. Francis argues that, quote, no matter, no matter how much you live in the experience of these years of your youth, you will never know their deepest and fullest meaning unless you encounter each day your best friend, the friend who is Jesus, end quote. Francis recognizes that adolescents tend to prioritize the formation and maintenance of friendships and intimate relationships during this stage in their lives. And he grounds an invitation to respond to God's love in the experience of friendship with Jesus. This is, he suggests, a never ending relationship that provides constancy, reliability, and confidence for the future. Second, the full flourishing of young people, and indeed of all people, is the hallmark of Francis's operative theological anthropology, as revealed in Christus Vivit. In advocating for human flourishing, he is realistic about the challenges and hardships faced by many young people around the world. Among these, he names war, exploitation, marginalization, exclusion based on religious, ethnic, and economic status, and the commercialization of youthfulness. In particular, Francis focuses on the challenges posed by digital media, uh, migration, and abuse as significantly detrimental to the lives and well being of young people. While realistic about the many difficult challenges faced by young people, Francis does insist that God is calling all people, and particularly young people, to a life of flourishing and thriving. He says, quote, God who loves you wants you to be happy, end quote. While he does not explicitly lay out what flourishing looks like, given that this will vary according to culture, nation, and individual, he does say that God desires that all humans be able to live a life that brings contentment, satisfaction, and well-being. In particular, Francis argues that this loving God is calling young people to live life fully. He says, quote, you have to discover who you are and develop your own ways of being holy, whatever others may say or think. Becoming a saint means becoming more fully yourself, becoming what the Lord wished to dream and create, and not a photocopy of someone else. Your life ought to be a prophetic stimulus to others and leave a mark on this world, the unique mark that only you can leave, end quote. Francis names fraternal relationships and service to the world as ways that young people can find this flourishing life. Already oriented to the formation of friendships, Francis invites young people to a communal life, recognizing the beauty and dignity of others and seeking their thriving. In this way, the bonds of friendship draw us outside of ourselves. Francis says, quote, God loves the joy of young people. He wants them especially to share in the joy of fraternal communion the sublime joy felt by those who share with others. Fraternal love multiplies our ability to experience joy since it makes us rejoice in the good of others. May your youthful spontaneity increasingly find expression in fraternal love and a constant readiness to forgive, to be generous, and to build community." End quote. A particularly important part of flourishing for Francis is service to the world. He suggests that young people can find great satisfaction and joy in service that is oriented towards solidarity with others, particularly the poor and the marginalized. 
he commends the various ways that young people already commit themselves to the service of others, assisting the poor, working to end environmental degradation, fighting against oppression and marginalization. He calls them to continue these efforts to make the world a better place and to, quote, offer a Christian response to the social and political troubles emerging in different parts of the world, end quote. In these ways, young people are witnessing to a way of living that is full of joy, a sense of purpose and love. For Francis, this flourishing young person who is oriented towards relationship and community is, the one, is one who is living the now of God. Finally, and most importantly, Francis argues that being a young person is a good in itself, that youth is to be valued, and that young people are not merely immature, not yet adults. He insists that, quote, youth is not something to be analyzed in the abstract. Indeed, youth does not exist. There exist only young people, each with the reality of his or her own life, end quote. Being a young person is more than simply being in a period of transition between childhood and adulthood. It is a distinguishable life stage that is different from both of these. In fact, for Francis, youth is a time of special grace. He says, quote, God is the giver of youth and he is at work in the life of each young person. Youth is a blessed time for the young and a grace for the church and for the world. It is joy, a song of home and blessing. Making the most of our youthful years entails seeing this season of life as worthwhile in itself and not simply as a brief prelude to adulthood, end quote. So while Francis is very aware that adolescence is experienced by adolescence as a stage in life that is oriented towards a future adulthood, he wants to insist that it is an important stage of life during which young people are both learning from and contributing to the world around them. The great gift of adolescence for Francis is a hopefulness and a future orientation that seems characteristic of many young people. He calls on young people to dream big dreams and to look to the future with joy and hope. He says, quote, youth as a phase in the development of the personality is marked by dreams which gather momentum, by relationships which acquire more and more consistency and balance, by trials and experiments, and by choices which gradually build a life project. At this stage in life, the young are called to move forward without cutting themselves off from their roots, to build autonomy, but not in solitude. Some time ago, a friend asked me what I see in a young person. My response was that I see someone who is searching for his or her own path, who wants to fly on their two feet, who faces the world and looks at the horizon with eyes full of the future, full of hope as well as illusions. To talk about young people is to talk about joy, end quote. While Francis understands adolescence as an orientation towards the future, this is not because being an adult is somehow better than or more to be valued than being young. Rather, it is the very future orientation that makes a young person valuable in its own, that makes being a young person valuable in its own right. These are the graces and blessings that young people bring to the church and to the world, to be future oriented, to be hopeful, to be oriented towards building relationships and to dream big dreams. That said, I do want to note one weakness in the document, one that has the potential to limit its reception by the very young people that Francis is reaching out to because Francis is speaking to at least three audiences in this document, young people, those who minister to them, and the whole church, there is an awkwardness to the document. Francis is often switching back and forth between addressing young people themselves and a clearly adult audience. This has the effect of implying that the young people are not fully a part of the conversation about them. Alongside of this, 
is a sense of Francis speaking to young people in much the same way as the ancient sage spoke to the young men of the book of Proverbs. Like Proverbs, it is the advice of an older adult for a young person who has no voice in the document. All of this seems to somewhat undercut Francis's message that adolescence and young adulthood are stages of life that are in themselves valuable and that young people have a voice and a role in the church. Nevertheless, Francis's perspective on young people as articulated in Christus Vivit provides us with an optimistic vision of adolescence and with some clear signposts for systematic theologians to consider in the construction of a more capacious theological anthropology that considers age in general and adolescence in particular. In this section, I want to sketch out some preliminary thoughts about the directions that such a theological anthropology of adolescence may take. And here I am reminded of Rahner's assertion in his essay, Ideas for a Theology of Childhood, that everything about what it means to be a human person that pertains to the adult also applies to the child. So what the church says about its understanding of the nature of the human person should apply to adolescence. And what we know about adolescence should appear in our theological reflections on the human person. So in this section, therefore, I want to take up three of the traditional categories of theological anthropology creation in the image of God, sin, and grace. And consider the ways that these can be expanded when we bring adolescence into our theological view. So number one, young people are created in the image of God. The Imago Dei doctrine, which claims that God created humanity in God's own image and likeness, has formed the background of much theological anthropological reflection. In this doctrine derived from Genesis chapter one, 26 and 27, we claim that human beings are created by God to be like God in some way. And for nearly 2000 years, Christian theologians have puzzled over what it is in humanity that is like God. For much of that tradition, theologians, most influentially Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, have located the image of God in the human person in our rationality, in our ability to think and reason. Feminist theologians and theologians of color have rightly noted that this has been used as a way to exclude women and people of color from being considered as fully in the image of God. Similarly, theologians who take childhood seriously insist that the Imago Dei does not reside in any one human quality. Indeed, children remind us that rationality cannot be the sole locus of the Imago Dei. Children, like people with developmental delays, serious mental illness, or dementia, show us that imaging God cannot be dependent on how well we reason. The insights of feminist theologians, theologians of color, and theologians considering childhood reveal a tension that exists in theological reflections on this, doct on this doctrine. Theologians want to affirm that the Imago Dei remains a constant in each, individual's, in, in, in each individual throughout their life. At the same time, we need to affirm that humans do not express the Imago Dei in the same way at each stage in their lives. Theologians who consider childhood also importantly remind us that being created by God in the image of God is not something we attain at adulthood. One does not grow into one's imaging of God. It is not something that develops in us, nor is it something that could decline as we age. No one images God partially or deficiently. Evangelical theologian John Kilner makes the important point that it is not particular human qualities that determine our status as a Mago Dei. Rather, being in the image of God is a statement about the whole person and about humanity as a whole. He bases this on the Genesis 1 account of the creation of humanity, that it is a story of the creation of humanity and not the story of the creation of a particular human. 
This allows us to keep both individual persons and humanity as a whole in view as we consider the image of God. As Kilner asserts, quote, thus referring to a particular people, referring to particular people as being God's image is legitimate, but it is always in the context of and never separate from their identity as members of humanity. Speaking of all humanity as created in God's image is legitimate as well, but that is inclusive of, not to the exclusion of, particular human beings, end quote. So when we speak of the Imago Dei symbol, it is important to remember that we are talking about both individual persons who are created in the image of God and about humanity in general. This also means that while each person reflects something of the image of God in their life, the, to the totality of what it means to be created in the image of God can only come into view when we look to all of humanity. As we consider adolescence in conversation with Pope Francis's operative theological anthropology of youth, this means that we cannot exclude them from any understanding of the Imago Dei symbol. In fact, we must include them in our understandings of the Imago Dei symbol if we want the symbol to function more adequately as a descriptor of what it means to be human. As Kilner argues, when we say that adolescents are created in the image of God, we have to have both real individual adolescence and all of humanity in mind. Therefore, even though adolescents are still developing in their abilities to think rationally or relate to others or make moral decisions, because they are human, they are already fully participating in the Imago Dei. Number two, young people sin. Interestingly, the church's reflections on sin is one of the few places where age is taken seriously by theologians. In particular, theologians of the tradition have debated the relative sinfulness of children and the age at which children can be held responsible for their sins. Augustine, for example, believed that because of original sin, even infants are born sinful and demonstrate sinful tendencies, even if their ability to actually sin is limited due to physical immaturity. Lutheran theologian Marcia Bunge also discusses this tendency. She says, quote, Christian tradition often describes children as sinful creatures and moral agents. The whole nature of children, Calvin says, is a seed of sin. Thus it cannot be, cannot be but hateful and abominable to God. Johann Arndt claims that within children lies a hidden evil root of poisonous tree and an evil seed of the serpent. Jonathan Edwards writes that as innocent as even infants appear to be, if they are out of Christ, they are not so, they are not so in God's sight, but are young vipers and are infinitely more hateful than vipers. And as Bunge points out, this focus on the inherent sinfulness of children has played a part in the abuse of children. When children are vipers, they must be broken with harsh punishments, providing a theological justification for the emotional and physical abuse of children. While views of sin that lead to the abuse of children are clearly unacceptable, the idea of children as sinners nevertheless holds some important truths to be considered as we think about adolescence. Bunge suggests three aspects of theological reflection on the sinfulness of children that are worth carrying forward that children are born into a broken and sinful world, that children do commit actual sins, although their level of accountability for those sins is lessened, and that children need nurture and formation to develop into healthy adults. As we think about the implications of these reflections on sin and children, we also need to be attentive to the cultural forces at work in shaping how contemporary Western cultures view adolescence. While many psychologists and sociologists have noted the ways in which contemporary life seems, for example, to treat young people as consumers and to isolate them from traditional structures of support, 
there is also a tendency to treat young people as problems to be solved. We tend to think about how young people need to be corralled, controlled, contained. Psychologist Richard Lerner describes this as a deficit model of understanding young people. Rather than focusing on the gifts that young people bring, our institutions, policies, and practices with young people are often aimed at fixing or preventing problems, ensuring that young people do not do bad things. Instead of valuing them for the unique individuals that they are, we tend to focus our theological and pastoral attention on what is going wrong with them, on the mistakes they make, and on the sins they commit. Keeping in mind this general tendency to think about adolescence as problems that need solving, it is helpful to look at the question of adolescent sin through the three lenses that Bunge offered in relation to children. First, adolescents live in a broken world. Social sin and systemic injustice shape their lives in profound ways. As discussed above, Francis notes that young people face significant oppressive challenges and the intersections of age with other forms of oppression means that adolescents can be particularly impacted by systemic injustices. For example, the intersection of age, race, and gender means that adolescent girls of color are particularly vulnerable to sex trafficking and other forms of exploitation. Systemic injustices have deformed the world in which these adolescents live, and they are formed as members of society by these sinful systemic forces. Second, adolescents commit sins and they should be held accountable for those sinful acts. Adolescents are certainly capable of making choices that harm themselves in their relationships with others. Because they live in a broken world and are as likely as anyone else to act in selfish ways, they fail to love their neighbors or to act justly. Adolescents ought to be held accountable for the times that they do so. Although as with children, we need to allow for differing levels of accountability for personal sins committed in a context of systemic injustice and varying developmental capabilities. For example, in the United States, the tendency to treat young violent offenders as adults in the criminal justice system make it seem as if society is taking a tough on crime approach. However, this trend of treating even early adolescents as adults does not, a take account, does not take account of their cognitive development or the effect that being an adolescent in an adult prison population might have on the young offender. And third, adolescents need formation in the faith and in moral decision-making. In some ways, this task is even more urgent for adolescents than it is for children because of the nature of the moral choices they face. Questions of, for example, sexual morality, participation in the global economy, and political participation are more significant questions for young people than they are for children. And yet our faith formation programs, especially for adolescents who do not attend Catholic high schools, tend to end in late childhood. This means that many adolescents and indeed many adults, are trying to make their way in a world of complex moral and justice issues equipped only with the moral formation appropriate for a child. As we seek a more robust theological anthropology of adolescence, rooted in Francis's vision in Christus Vivit, the category of sin requires particular attention. As Francis suggests, young people are at a particular risk to are at particular risk to the effects of a sinful world. And including adolescents, as well as children and older adults, can lend both precision and expansiveness to our social analyses. At the same time, as Bunge reminds us, adolescents are also sinners and in need of formation. Including them in our theological view is a stern reminder that faith formation does not end with children and must include adolescents and of course, young adults, middle-aged adults, and older adults. Including adolescents in our theological view means that our reflections on the sinfulness of the world and of individuals will take on more nuance 
as more occasions of sin are brought into focus. And number three, young people experience God's grace. Theology since the mid 20th century has identified grace with both God's unconditional love for humanity and humanity's experience of God's presence and love in history. Bronner, in particular, provided Catholic theology with a renewed emphasis on grace, insisting that because of God's universal love for humanity, grace is experienced by humans mediated through historical reality and in the experience of transcendence. For Rahner, human beings are drawn towards something larger than themselves because humans have an innate desire for the supernatural. In other words, God's grace is known in the real lives of people as they experience the call towards something larger than themselves. Grace is found in the experience of being called by God into relationship with God. In his essay, Ideas for a Theology of Childhood, Rahner understands the experiences of childhood as experiences of transcendence and therefore of God's grace. He suggests that childhood is openness to the unknown, trust in others, and courage to face new experiences. In this, children experience transcendence and God's grace. While Rahner insists that as already fully human persons, children have the capacity for experiences of transcendence, what he does not reflect on is how these experiences are understood by the children themselves. In other words, because the experience of grace is often seen out of the corner of the eye, Awareness of it requires an ability to be present to oneself and one's experiences that children and adolescents cannot yet articulate. Thus, while we can insist with Rahner that an adolescent has experiences of transcendence, we cannot say that they understand this in the same way that an adult would. Young people are, according to developmental psychologist Robert Keegan, enmeshed in a cognitive growth process that is shaping the ways that they make meaning of their worlds. In particular, young people are in the process of making the mental leap from what Keegan calls second order thinking to third order thinking. Second order thinkers are able to recognize what he calls durable categories, that objects can be grouped into categories that have characteristics that endure, like trucks or people or houses. Similarly, second order thinkers recognize that other people are individuals who have their own ideas, desires, and points of view. As people transition into third order thinkers, they develop the ability to think across durable categories. As Keegan puts it, quote, the capacity to subordinate durable categories to the interaction between them makes their thinking abstract, their feelings a matter of inner states and self-reflexive emotion, and their social relating capable of loyalty and devotion to a community of people or ideas larger than the self." End quote. It is only with the development of third order thinking that people are able to stand outside of a relationship to analyze it, to value the relationship in itself and not simply for what it provides and to think about abstract concepts like friendship. And importantly, it is only with third order thinking that a person can recognize and analyze the experience of transcendence, the experience of ideas larger than the self. That grace is experienced as a corner of the eye glimpse means that grace is known in the reflection after the fact on the experiences of transcendence and not necessarily in the experience itself. Many, perhaps most adolescents and many adults are not yet capable of this level of abstract reflection on a relationship or experience. For them, relationships and experiences are things that just are. However, despite this not yet developed ability, we need to explicitly affirm that adolescence experiences are in fact experiences of God's grace, God's unconditional love for humanity, 
and the experience of that in our historical situatedness. Therefore, including adolescence in our theological reflections on the doctrine of grace means that we need to account for how grace is experienced by people who are not yet able to describe, much less reflect on, that experience for themselves. However, including this affirmation of the presence of God and the experience of that presence as grace in the life of adolescence, as well as children and those with cognitive or developmental dif differences, is a reminder that our definitions of grace always need to be open and expansive, and that there is no human experience that is excluded from God's grace, even when that experience cannot be recognized, described, or reflected on. In conclusion, Pope Francis gives theologians a great deal to reflect on with his 2019 apostolic exhortation, Christus Vivit. His recognition of the challenges facing contemporary young people, as well as the many and various gifts they bring to the church, means that theologians need to take age seriously as a category of reflection in our theological anthropologies. Francis insists that adolescence is not merely a stage of development through which one must pass in order to reach the goal of adulthood. There is a givenness to adolescence and young adulthood. It is an already and not yet. While it is true that these are life stages through which people grow and develop, they are also moments in an individual's development that are valuable for their own sake. Rahner names this already and not yet perspective when we think about childhood. He says, quote, the grace of childhood is not merely the pledge of the grace of adulthood. The fact that childhood contributes to later stages of life is not the sole criterion of its own intrinsic greatness. It must be the case that childhood is valuable in itself, end quote. Francis is calling us to a theology of youth that names adolescence as graced in itself and not merely as a stepping stone to the grace of adulthood. Incorporating age and the experience of people across the lifespan into our theological anthropologies will provide the church with a more capacious theology of the human person that will better ground the pastoral and formational work of its ministers. Thank you. At this point, any, I'm happy to answer any questions from folks here in the room, even folks from the from online. Um, if anybody has any questions, I will come to you with the microphone so that we can capture it on the recording. This is uh, just a personal question to ask for your opinion, having listened to everything you said. Um, I've always believed that a child's um, child is a tabula rasa. And people close to me, especially when she's a teacher, she disagrees with me strongly. I'm just curious about your take on it. About whether the child is a blank slate on which society and his or her parents then proceed to write and form that child. Yes and no, although I'm leaning more towards no. Um, I do think that children are deeply, deeply formed, and adolescents and adults as well. We are all deeply, deeply formed by the circumstances into which we are born. So things about um, our lives that we can't change, like race and gender, sexual orientation, um, economic class, things like that um, shape who we become. I think that our families, definitely families and friendships and all of those kinds of important relationships shape who we are and who we become, um, and especially for children. Um, 
That said, I do think there are fundamental things about any human person that pertain to that human person regardless of their age or formation. And those are mostly theological things in, for me. Um, things like the idea that a person is created in the image of God, the idea that a person has inherent dignity because of that, um, the idea that humans are fundamentally social, that we are oriented towards relationship fundamentally, um, which isn't to say that every person, every child experiences those as while I think those are universal-ish, um, I don't think that they are experienced by every person the same way. Um, I also think that you know, the research being done with children who were who spent their early earliest years infancy through say age two or three in orphanages particularly in eastern europe show us that um, those kinds of experiences do have profound impact on people that the experiences of very early childhood in part create who we are, but they don't, but they're not totalizing. Um, so yes and no is the answer to that question. Thank you. There's a question on the Zoom about how we can begin to roll these teachings or these ideas into our uh, Sunday school programming, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, sorry, can you just repeat that? How, how can we incorporate the ideas and the teachings that you're talking about into actual like Sunday school programs? Um, I think that on a very basic level, we need to think about the ways in which we treat adolescents in our um, church programming um, as problems that need corralling, right? Um, most programming for adolescents in parishes involves taking adolescents out of the adult population and putting them in the basement of the church. Right? We do this with children as well, but in particular with adolescents. Um, and we take them down there to the basement and we tell them that they, as fully confirmed members of the church, that they are fully members of the church down here in the basement while everybody else is upstairs doing the real stuff. Um, and I think that, and we do that for good reasons. Like adolescents want to hang out with other adolescents. Don't get me wrong. They, they're adolescents. Um, and it's easier to create programming that meets their particular needs when we remove them from the, from the adult population. But what we don't do is ever reintegrate them back into the adult population. We don't invite them to sit on the parish council. We don't invite them to um, participate in the mass except for when we need them, a youth representative for something. Um, and so I think that starting with how we think about what it means to be a full member of the church, a fully co confirmed member of the church, um, is the first step along that way. Um, it would also get us away from treating confirmation like an exit sacrament um, as well, but that's a whole other talk. Um, I also think that we, we need to think about how we do faith formation with adolescents in a way that is especially for adolescents who don't attend um, Catholic schools. Um, we need to think about how we attend to faith formation and moral formation for adolescents in ways that takes their real lived experiences seriously. Um, you know, yet another abstinence talk isn't necessarily going to get them on our side with the church's uh, sexual moral, moral teachings. Um, yeah, you know, so we need to think of, think more creatively. We need to think together with adolescents when we're thinking about faith formation programs. Um, it needs to meet the actual needs of the actual adolescents that are actually in the room, um, and not what we think they need. Um, okay, that's great. Thank you. We've got another question here in the audience. 
uh, Cynthia, first of all, thank you for that, that wonderful lecture. If I, if I heard one thing that really inspired me, it was to not think about adolescence as transitional. So your sense of, of a graced existence in it. I, I'd like to pick your brain on, on the idea of category two and category three thinking. And in particular, the distinction that you were making between having, having an experience of transcendence, but not yet being able to articulate what that might mean as, as a category two. And, and this builds on the last question. So I think about our, our community of churches and how you started with your lecture. This is about youth, but yet youth seem to be exiting our very structures. So I wondered just as a practical theologian, are there ideas uh, that you might want to advance about how the church might create a community around these experiences for youth to experience them? You spoke about justice and social service, but again, just wondering how we were part of that journey as a, as a friend and how we cultivate transcendence within our youth. Keegan, in his description of um, cognitive development across the lifespan, um, talks about that shift as, um, calls it ob subject object theory, um, where an object is a person, a relationship, a thing, an idea, that we can think about, we can we can hold that idea and we can think about it for a little while. Um, subject are those things in our thinking that just exist, um, and that we you know we can't really separate ourselves enough from it to think about it. Um, think about the difference between the way an infant relates to the mother and the way a child relates to the mother. For an infant, the mother is not separate from the child. Um, but as, as children grow, they start to see themselves as independent beings and they start to say things like, no. Um, so that subject object switch is what, or shift, is what prompts more sophisticated thinking that moves us from one, le one order to the next. Um, and for Keegan, that happens in what he calls a holding environment. A holding environment is an environment where the person is both supported and challenged. So the mother of a young child um, so provides, the mother of the young child, the infant who, who is not yet capable of seeing her as a separate individual, supports that and provides the, the love and support that the infant needs. At the same time, as that child is growing and developing, provides it with increasingly complex um, experiences that start to show that child that they are in fact separate people, um, leaving it alone for a moment or two, for example. Um, so all of that to say, um, I think that when we're looking at how we accompany adolescence in that second order to third order shift, we need to think in terms of what they can see and reflect on um, and what they're developing the ability to see and reflect on and how we can create holding environments that support where they are and challenge them into new ideas. Teresa O'Keefe, who is a religious educator at Boston College, um, talks about the importance of what she calls robust relationships between adults and adolescents. And I think that that's what Keegan is talking about here in terms of holding environments. Um, for O'Keefe, a robust relationship between an adult and an adolescent is a relationship in which that adult knows where that child is, that adolescent is in their thinking, and invites them to think in increasingly complex ways, and does this in large part by modeling it themselves. So we can't expect the adolescent to figure out for themselves why the church does social justice work. The adult has to explain it, narrate it. So together we are painting this school and the adult is saying, you know, so I'm here painting this school because of X, Y, and Z. These are my reasons. This is how it forms my relationship with God. You don't have to think that way, but this is, these are my experiences of that. And I think it's in that process where adults are as transparent as possible about their own thinking, their, their hopefully third order thinking, about these experiences of transcendence. 
that adolescents can start to see it for themselves. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay, good. Anything Thank else? you very much. And uh, fun fact, Teresa O'Keefe is a St. Mike's alum. I know that. <laughs> and was at a uh, reunion earlier in the weekend too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And we have another audience uh, question. Do we have any more questions online? Okay. I'm just wondering if the Pope or any theologian has um, given any ideas how the church is to compete with social media and youth. <laughs> the short answer is no, not really. Um, that said, I think that Pope Benedict the 16th and now Pope Francis um, are in this moment where the church is realizing the, both the dangers of and the gifts possible in social media. Um, social media in and of itself is not necessarily for Francis, I think, a bad thing. Um, it's the, the fact that social media has the potential and in fact the reality of becoming um, abusive, um, cyberbullying and all that kind of stuff. Um, at the same time, I think he sees it as a very useful tool for reaching out to people because Young people are living their lives highly connected through social media. And if the church isn't speaking in that space, how are, the, how are young people going to hear what the church has to say? Um, which isn't to say that you know, every parish needs to have a Twitter account or a TikTok or whatever, right? But that, um, that the church needs to take seriously the fact that these social media tools are a highly integrated part of young people's lives. And we can't just say, don't do that. Um, it's bad for you. Um, it didn't work very well on um, questions of sexual morality. I'm not sure it'll necessarily work much better for questions of digital morality either. Um, rather, I think that what, what we need to do, what the church needs to do is engage students in that space in a healthier way, um, inviting them into relationship with one another, with adults and with the church and with God in that digital space. Um, now, I don't, I don't know how to do that with TikTok or Twitter or Insta, whatever. Um, but I think that I think that that's I think that's a necessary part of of what it means to be an evangelizing church in the 21st century. Thanks so much. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Cynthia Cameron for an amazing lecture. Thank you. Uh, our final lecture of. Alumni Reunion 2022.